series, we hooked a rotary encoder up to a breadboard and demonstrated how it worked by blinking some LEDs. Now let's hook it up to an Arduino and see what we can do. We'll begin by removing most of the parts from our first experiment. Let's clear out some of these wires. We won't need the current limiting resistors. Instead, we'll be using pull-up resistors that are built right into the Atmega chip. We won't need our LEDs. We'll take them out. But we'll be replacing them with the pair of capacitors. They go right in the same place where the LEDs were, but there's no polarity on the capacitors. One bridges encoder pin A with the center common, and the other bridges terminal pin B also with the center common. I'll attach a black lead to the center common. This will go to ground on our Arduino later. I'm attaching an orange lead to the A terminal and our first capacitor. And finally, I'll connect a white lead to the B terminal and our second capacitor. That's all the wires we'll need on our breadboard. Now I'm going to remove this encoder with its bare shaft. I like to replace it with another one that I've attached a knob to. This will make it much easier to rotate. Now let's hook up my pet Arduino. First I'll hook the black lead up to ground. Now I'm going to hook the white lead up to digital pin 3. And finally the orange lead gets hooked into digital pin 2. Quick review here. Encoder pin A hooks up to digital pin 2. Encoder pin B hooks up to digital pin 3. And the common pin in the center hooks up to ground on the Arduino. Let's talk a moment about key bounds. If you've been doing very many projects with an Arduino, by now you've probably come across the phenomenon of key bounds. Whenever we're dealing with mechanical switches or buttons, there's always an issue about how clean of a contact we can make at any given moment. This is especially true of these inexpensive rotary encoders. But because we have two internal mechanical switches operating simultaneously, the typical software solutions such as short delays won't work in this case. We've added two tiny capacitors to our circuit to help solve this problem. Capacitors are like little miniature shock absorbers. If we dump 5 volts into the beginning of this circuit, we don't get 5 volts instantly out at the end. That's because the electrons think they see a path to ground through the capacitor. Once the capacitor is fully charged, it will be at 5 volts too and that's when the electrons start flowing to the rest of the circuit. The exact opposite happens when we open the circuit. When we turn the power off, the electrons stored in the capacitor flow back out and keep the circuit running for just a moment longer. It's our hope that while these capacitors are acting like little shock absorbers and delaying the on and the off time ever so slightly, that any key bounces that occur will occur during that period of time. We'll get a bunch of them, but not all of them. We'll be using a logic table in our code to clean up the rest. And guess what? That means we get to talk about nibbles and bits. On the right of your screen, you see a live video of our encoder attached to the breadboard and the Arduino with only three lines. The encoder, of course, is hiding back here behind the knob. On the opposite side of the screen you see our monitor. It's displaying um, that the encoder is ready. It shows that currently we're set to a level of 50. Watch as I turn the knob clockwise how the numbers appear to change on the monitor.
and now counterclockwise. Let's take a look at the data in the monitor window. The first column represents the two terminals on our encoder. The first digit is pin A, the second digit is pin B. One is on, zero is off. The middle column represents the direction I'm turning the knob. One is clockwise, minus one is counterclockwise. The last column shows how a value, which I call level, changes as I turn the knob forward and backward. Let's look again at the first column. It's not just a coincidence that these look like binary numbers. We can represent the two states of each pin as bits in a two-digit binary number. Here's a table of all the possible combinations. 0, 0 means both pins A and B are low. 0, 1 means pin A is low, pin B is high. 1, 0, pin A is high, B is low and 1, 1 means both A and B are high. The sketch I'm running uses an interrupt to check the states of these pins. Here's the code that sets that up. The Arduino allows us to have two external interrupts. One, called 0, is attached to pin 2. Interrupt 1 is attached to pin 3. I'm only using the first one, interrupt 0. That's why the first pin of our encoder is hooked up to digital pin 2 on the Arduino. That's interrupt 0. The second parameter is a function we want to call when an event triggers our interrupt. I call that function knob turned. The last parameter is the event that's going to trigger the interrupt. My choices are changed, rising, and falling. I chose rising because I want to call my function every time my pin switches from low to high. We can use these binary numbers as sort of a truth table to tell us what we should be doing with our value when we turn the knob. We can build a table that shows us which direction we're moving. Zero, zero is somewhere between two stops, so we don't know which direction we're moving. We don't want to do anything here, so we'll call this one zero. Zero, one is not a valid value. Remember, we're calling this function when pin A goes high. So, if pin A is supposed to be high, it can't be zero. This is clearly a spike. It's a key bounce. So, we'll put zero on this one, too. If pin A is high and B is low, I know we're going backwards, so we'll assign this one minus one. If both pins are high, we're going forward, so this one gets the value one. This is how I set up the table in an Arduino sketch. We set up an array of integers called bump. They have to be integers because one of our values is a negative number. Here it is in a nutshell. When the knob turns, we quickly read both pins A and B and create a binary number out of that. We use the binary number as a pointer. We look into this array to see what value to add to our previous level. A valid reading will produce a 1 or a minus 1. A key bounce will produce a zero. Let's twist our knob again and see what we can get. The first time I did this, I turned the knob very smoothly, and we got a perfect readout. This time, let me turn it back and forth a little more erratically. Maybe we can produce a key bounce. I think we got one. It looks like we got at least three. Here's a zero one here. Here's another zero one. And down here, we've got a zero zero. So you can see our little lookup table did a good job of cleaning up the key bounce. But what about those capacitors we put on the board? Are they really doing anything? Let's find out. Okay, so let's take these two capacitors off of our breadboard. There's one, two. The capacitors are now out of the circuit. Well, let's see what happens now when we turn the knob. 
Look at all the zeros. Look at all the errors that occur. The key bounce goes crazy. Here's a quick little peek at the sketch that I've been using for this demo. I'll copy it and put it in the comments for you so that you can get it there, copy it yourself, and paste it into your own project. If you don't find it on YouTube, look for it on my Google Plus channel. Here's the URL. Did you see my earlier video on digital potentiometers? Here's a short clip from that episode. You can hear the tone go up and down as we cycle through all the values from 0 to 255 and then back down again from 255 to 0. Well, here's pretty much that same circuit haywired together. We've got our digital potentiometer, we've got our tone decoder, which is currently acting as our oscillator, and we've installed our rotary encoder over here. Let's turn it on. How about that? Well, that just about covers it for this episode. I hope you get a chance to use digital encoders in some of your projects. If you do, share them with us. In the meantime, this is WB7FHC saying 73s. And hey, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share.